Good afternoon and welcome to the Netroots Women's Pre-Conference. How about that DJ, DJ Jazz? I don't know about you, but I'm here in my house in Maine dancing this afternoon, not only because of the music, but because of how excited I am that we're all gathered together. My name is Emily Kane. I'm proud to be the executive director of Emily's List. My pronouns are she, her. And yes, I know what you're thinking. That does make me Emily from Emily's List, but it's not what you th might think. Emily is actually an acronym. It stands for early money is like yeast. It makes the dough rise. It raises the dough. And that's how Emily's List was originally created, to help women raise early campaign funds, to build strong campaigns, to build winning campaigns. At Emily's List, we believe in the power of women and women's leadership and are thrilled to be your host again for the Netroots Women's Pre-Conference. This is actually the fourth year we've hosted the conference with Netroots. Two in person, remember those days, and two awesome virtual conferences last year and this year. Thank you so much for joining us. We wanna hear from you. So while I'm talking, feel free to put your name in the chat where you're tuning in from, and tell us whether this is your first women's pre-conference or maybe your second, third, or even fourth, who knows. Today's program, over these next two hours, you're really in for a treat. We have inspiring speakers, we have relevant information that's all gonna lay out what's at stake and how each of us can stay in the fight as we advocate for our rights. And I have to say, as a former state legislator myself, I'm always thrilled and a little biased in my excitement to see some of our state and local elected officials join us. Today, you'll hear from Delegate Hala Ayala, also known as future Lieutenant Governor of Virginia, Hala Ayala. You'll hear from Arizona State Senator Victoria Steele, Texas State Representative Mary Gonzalez, and Assemblymember Chandra Summers Armstrong from Nevada. And very soon, in just a few minutes, you'll have the privilege of hearing from Emily's List's latest groundbreaker and history maker, our brand new president, LaFonza Butler. You're going to love her. But first, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Amy Allison, to share some remarks on behalf of Netroots Nation. And let me say this about Amy. Amy's a member of the Netroots Nation board, but she's also a writer, a democratic innovator, a visionary champion of racial and gender justice. She is the founder and president of She the People, which is the nation's leading organization dedicated to an America redefined and inspired by women of color. And let me tell you, in 2018, I had the privilege of being on the campaign trail with Amy in Georgia for our friend Stacey Abrams. And let's just say I hope we get the chance to do that again, Amy. So let me turn it over to you, Amy. Thanks for being with us and to all of you. Have a wonderful time today. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Emily. That was wonderful. And to hear the names that we're going to have the opportunity to be in conversation with and, and uh, hear from and to be in conversation with each other is so exciting. So uh, Emily set the stage beautifully. Uh, as, as founder and president of She the People, we are, I'm, you know, we're dedicated to building the political power of women of color. And it goes without saying, because so many of you are living this, but women of color are the center and the most powerful motivator for a multiracial, inclusive democratic coalition that will have to uh, do what we do uh, in a year uh, when again, uh, the, uh, the, uh, elections uh, are so much at stake. So we're just so, so proud, um, both the Chi the People, but as a board member of Netroots Nation to partner with Emily's List and to welcome you here uh, for this essential conversation. In the last few weeks have clarified, if nothing else has, the path to political power for us, for us women in this election, um, is going to be right through the fight for abor abortion access. Um, that will have uh, this fight will have the license and um, the ability to motivate women in the South and the Southwest, where uh, the majority in the Senate is at, 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 
at stake and where key state and statewide elections are going to be decided. We're also going to have to boldly lean into the culture wars that are being waged uh, by Republicans and the and um, proudly uh, talk about and redefine American history that includes all of us, uh, that uh, reflects all of us, because we understand that that attack is an attempt to diminish our political power. And we're going to have to be have to center organizers who are on the ground and are most able uh, to speak to voters, uh, to organize a community, and to translate broad-based national goals into local in order to have high turnout on the ground. All these things are going to be important, and all these things we're going to be talking about uh, at the Netroots conference. Uh, this conference and this time together will help us to unify on our strategies and our values, to get stronger together, to learn from each other, and move together with purpose. Women and women of color at the center of this fight, uh, the country is counting on us and the strategy and the relationships that we build here and through this week are going to be important to that. The collective power that we have will advance our interests, defend those who are under attack, and build a multiracial democracy that will advance justice for all of us. And I just want to say I am so happy to be here. I'm so happy to work with Emily's List on this and so happy uh, that you're in this fight. So chin up and heart open. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for those remarks, Amy. I'm Keontae Lee. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Community Engagement Manager at Emily's List. I'm very excited to be in conversation with LaFonza Butler today. LaFonza Butler is the third president in the 36 year history of Emily's List and the first woman of color and mother to lead the organization. Instead of me telling you about her many, many accomplishments and her vision, I'm excited to have her join me in conversation today. And I can't wait for you to hear from her directly. LaFonza, welcome. Thank you so much, Keontae, and thank you to all of the participants who are joining us today. I'm excited to be a part of, of the Emily's List community and to, to join this discussion with the uh, activists and leaders uh, here at, at Netroots. So I'm happy to join. Absolutely. We have such a great program in store, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. So we are all excited to have you leading Emily's List at this pivotal moment. Um, what can you share about the path that led you here and the perspective you bring to the work of electing Democratic pro-choice women? That's a, good, it's a really good question. My, my path is not a straight one uh, that, one, that someone um, looking at it might perceive um, to be one that would lead me to Emily's list. To Emily's list. Uh, look, Keontae, I grew up in Mississippi uh, in a small town, one stoplight. Uh, town in, in in Mississippi where I you know I know what it was like to you know not know where your next um, meal was going to come from or if you were going to have the lights uh, on in in your house. Um, I I saw um, what it was for my mother to work three jobs sometimes in the same day to make sure that me and my two brothers uh, had an opportunity uh, to have a better life. Um, and so I went from a small town in Mississippi to a premier historically black college uh, at Jackson State University uh, in Jackson, Mississippi, where I had professors who were, you know, SNCC organizers and core organizers. And, you know, they taught me about not just, you know, what it was like to struggle, but what it meant um, to actually um, um, learn about the institutions that created that struggle for certain parts of, of the country and, and certain parts of, of uh, communities. Uh, and then two weeks after I graduated from Jackson State, I worked for the labor movement. Um, I worked for SCIU where I learned really about how to build power. We're coming together where I was sort of really um, shown by working men and women um, the power of coming together and creating and demanding change on those very structures that I learned about in college and I saw uh, in my day-to-day -day life uh, as a kid. And so 
Um, what I hope to bring to Emily's list is, uh, is you know, sort of the, the completeness of that journey, the, the comprehensive nature of that journey where more women can see a bit of themselves in me and can find their political home uh, at Emily's list. Where together wow. we can and will build power to improve the lives of our children and our communities. You know, I love that you touched on your background and how it's not linear, because we're definitely going to get into more of that later on in the conversation. But I know you talked about just building political power, and that's a great segue to our next question, because there are many ways to create positive change. And the work of the many, the work of many of our allies joining today is a testament to that fact. Um, so what was it about Emily's list that made you decide to say yes to this opportunity? Um, you know, I, in my career, I had worked with, with Emily's List in a number of different elections um, that are, that SEIU and the, and the labor movement were a part of. And so, of course, I knew of the strong history of winning um, and building power for, for Democratic pro-choice women of, of Emily's List. But I, but I got to be honest, it wasn't, it wasn't the Emily's List um, story that convinced me to say yes. It was the story of my, my daughter. I have a seven-year-old. Uh, and, you know, I, as I was uh, considering um, the position and the opportunity, I remembered um, the conversation that was happening in my daughter's kindergarten class um, during the election time. Uh, and they had their own mock election in her kindergarten class. And she was the only kid um, who voted for the turtle. Um, lots of kids voted for the wolf. Lots of kids voted for um, the elephant. Some kids voted for the snake. And she was a little disappointed after the election and, and the turtle didn't win. And so I, I asked her, I was like, well, well, what made you vote for the turtle? She said he was the only one mama that wanted everything to be fair. He didn't want anyone to be left behind. And so as I was considering this role at Emily's List, you know, I really thought about it from the context of the kind of society that my daughter wanted to be a part of, that she wanted to live in. And I had to ask myself, was I um, waking up every single day, create, helping to create a society that was fair, um, a society where no one was left behind and and you know what an opportunity it would be at Emily's List to really continue to do that with um, with women who wanted to be a part of creating that same kind of society by offering themselves um, for public service. And so, as great as the story of Emily's List is, it was actually my kindergartner uh, uh, who and her and her class election that that convinced me that being at Emily's List um, was a way to wake up every single day. Um, and create the kind of future that Nyla wanted to be a part of. I love that you share the story about your daughter, Nyla, and it's just amazing um, just to hear about her courage for voting for something that she believed in um, and standing on her own, because that's how it is um, a lot of times in this work that we do. Um, and I want to just make a quick transition to the next question that is related to some of the remarks that you just said. Um, because you bring the vast experience as an organizer to Emily's List, I want to know how is your organizing experience, how did that make you the strategist and the leader that you are today? You know, my, my experience in, you know, my, my learning experience at, at Jackson State and being in and around so many organizers and activists who sacrificed it all, um, who spent weeks and months in jail to expand access to the franchise um, really did lead me then to a, the experience of working with the men and women of, of SEIU where, you know, they were uh, willing to sacrifice it all, um, willing to, you know, put their jobs at risk, their livelihoods, um, to be, be able to build power and build a different future for, for their families. And so, you know, I was able to um, take my experience, the experience of those who had poured into me um, and the everyday lives of, of the women, mostly women that I worked with in the labor movement, uh, and really think about how best to utilize those assets to really create change. And, you know, one, one story 
about um, the work, some work that we did in, in California was ra being making sure that California was going to be the first state to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Now, as um, the labor movement was working incredibly hard uh, to move those forward, um, uh, those issues forward, what we knew was that we couldn't do it by ourselves. We had to work with small business owners. We had to work with nonprofit organizations. We, we had to you know, really work with the legislature and the governor um, and, and figure out how to leverage our, our collective power. Um, and you know, there, there have been instances where I've had to walk away from negotiating tables. There have been instances where I've had to lead the march from the front, um, and, and, but also understood that I could be just as effective leading from behind. And so working, learning to work with others to be effective, um, appreciating the, the lived experiences that others bring to the table, I think are real examples of how and what I would like to bring as Emily's List really throws the door open to, to all women who want to serve in public office. You know, as I think about you telling your journey um, and sharing your experiences about how it wasn't a linear experience. Um, it makes me really reflect on my own journey. And I go back to how I got my start in activism. And similar to you, you know, I was a, a small girl from rural South, uh, across South Carolina. Um, and I participated in my very first protest um, because of the members of my church they organized um, a protest in defense of um, fighting against this concrete plant that was contaminating the water, the water in our community. And these were working class black and brown women. And I think that their, um, their demonstrated courage and resilience to fight for what was right and what was necessary and essential drinking water. I took that with me as I moved on to an HBCU similar to you, Spelman College. Um, and I think at Spelman College, I was able to grow my, my activism and my leadership um, with organizing and being active in student government. And I think I took the lessons at Spelman to my other professional opportunities all the way up to Emily's List. And I'm continuing those, um, those uh, just those ex experiences to support democratic pro-choice women um, that want to run for office, but also women leaders in the community. And while we're on the topic of activism and organizing. I want you to talk more about um, what you would say to young activists like myself, like others who are wondering if Emily's List is a political home for them. Look, look I, it's so interesting. The more that we, the more that we, the more time that we spend in spaces learning about the things that we have in common. Um, I think the more that we are able to really, really see that that Emily's List really is a, a, a home uh, for for all women who want to be who want to be leaders, whether it's a, a in public office or in activism. Um, it's I didn't know you were from South Carolina, so it's good. <laughs> I, I it's a great. I spent a lot of time in the in the uh, in South Carolina in the in the primary in 2019. So. Uh, learned learned a lot about the place. Look, I mm -hmm. this is a time where activism is at an all time high, um, where young people have just decided that they are going to fight for the future that they want. Very similar to what my own daughter said to me. Um, and so, I what I would like to say to to young activists who are are you know looking for a place to um, nurture their activism, who are looking for um, a, a place where they can, you know, talk safely uh, and learn about how to, you know, run for office and whether or not they should consider running for office. What I what I would say is is reach out to, to Emily's List. On we have the largest online community in Run to Win. That's more than ten thousand women that every day come together. Uh, and talk about some of those very challenges. I would say reach out to Emily's List because we have an internship program and a fellowship program where you can not only gain some of the hard skills and experiences, but bring your time and talent to, to help to shape the future of the organization as all of our fellows and our interns sit in meetings and are really an important part of, of moving the work forward. I would say 
reach out to Emily's List if you're a young activist, um, if you are a part of a, a, a sorority or um, you're a part of a, um, com a community that you know um, there is leadership and activism in that space and you're just looking for some some support because our our community engagement team is, uh, and I'm not just saying this because Keontae is, um, is doing the interview, but our community engagement team is fire. Like, and so I want... I want uh, young activists to know that Emily's List is there. It can be their political home um, because we have done, we have the infrastructure in place uh, to be able to support your leadership, to be able to create the uh, space um, for you to grow and to thrive. And I want to make sure that that folks reach out um, and that we're reaching out to you. And, and that's why we've always done uh, or for the last four years, we've done this Netroot, Netroots Nation conference is why we've built partnerships with young Demo with the young Democrats uh, of America. It's why we've done the work Keontae is doing. It reached out to the Panhellenic Council and other sororities and uh, and associations. Uh, that uh, where where you are that are in your community. We not only want you to reach out to, I don't just want you to reach out to us. I want you to hold us and help us reach out to you and be where, be proximate um, to where you are um, so that we can build uh, the power that we need for the change that we want to create. Absolutely. Wow. You said so much um, in response to that, but it doesn't, I'm, I'm sure everything that you have said will resonate with our audience and our attendees because Emily's List is here and we have the resources available along with a lot of our partner organizations. Um, well, Fonza, we are unfortunately out of time. I wish the two of us can talk for the rest of the program, but I don't wanna take away from all of the other great um, conversations that we have um, in store. And I just wanna add before I close, when I look at you, I see myself, I'm a black woman from a small town in the South and I know the importance of breaking the barriers um, for uh, women of all backgrounds so they can know that they can run for office and access our resources. Um, I'm excited that you are our president. I'm excited to continue this work with you. And I know you're gonna take the organization to new and higher heights. So thank you so much for being in conversation with me today. Thank you, Keonti. Thank you again to all uh, the participants who joined. Um, have a great rest of the session. I'm excited to, to go off to and, and watch and be a participant as well. So thank you so much. Uh, and we'll be seeing everyone soon. Absolutely. Thank you. So now I would like to introduce my colleague, Johanna Silverwalkie. Um, she's the Vice President of Training and Community Engagement and she will lead the next portion of this event. Welcome, Johanna. I'm so excited for this panel. Thanks, Keontae. What a great interview. I'm glad our audience got to know a little bit more about our new president, which we're all excited about. Well, thank you again, and good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Johanna Silva-Waki. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Vice President for Training and Community Engagement at EMILY's List. And I wanna welcome you to our first panel today holding the line, fighting for our rights at the national level. At EMILY's List, we understand too well that the issue of abortion rights and voting rights are interconnected. Our democratic pro-choice candidates at the national, state, and local level hold the line on a lot of these issues, and many are able to do so with the help of the organizations who are joining us here today. We're honored to convene these incredible leaders of national groups for a conversation about their work on advocating for the rights of women and their families. I wanna welcome Melanie Russell Newman, Senior Vice President of Communications and Culture at Plant Parenthood Federation of America and Plant Parenthood Action Fund. Uma Ayer, Vice President for Marketing and Communications for the National Women's Law Center. Isra Pananone Weeks, Chief of Staff for the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum and Liza Conrad, Director of Voter Protection for Fair Fight Action. Thank you all so much for joining me today. So as you know, we're in a challenging time where there are so many issues that are directly impacting the lives of women and their families. All of you help to lead important national organizations that support women in a variety of ways. Can you tell our audience about your work and how you're supporting and advocating for the rights that directly impact women, especially at this moment? I'd love to start with you, Melanie. 
Sure, and thank you so much for having me today. Uh, my name is Melanie Roussel Newman. I am Senior Vice President for Communications and Culture at the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. And in that role, I work uh, to communicate about the important work that we are doing at Planned Parenthood. Uh, as you know, Planned Parenthood uh, has 600 health centers across all 50 states. And um, on, on the Federation side and on the Action Fund side, we are fighting every single day to expand access to abortion, to protect and maintain access to abortion and reproductive health. And now is the most important moment in that fight. Uh, you know about SB in Texas and Jackson's Women Health, the uh, Supreme Court uh, case that is coming up in December. We are on the front lines of fighting to protect access to abortion and reproductive health right now. Thank you for that. Uma, can you talk about the work of the National Women's Law Center? Sure, and thank you as well for having me. And it's great to be with this um, group of colleagues who um, are also, we're on the in the trenches together, so it's great to see everyone in this grid today. Um, the Law Center has uh, been on the front lines of almost every gender justice fight in this country for almost half a century. And we believe that women and girls don't live um, single issue lives, they live multi issue lives, especially women of color, LGBTQ people and women in families with low income. So we we work to address all of the issues that they take on, which um, is exa is exhausting for all of us on this grid, I think. Um, and especially when when those folks are dealing with those issues sometimes all at once. And our primary focus is to drive change in the courts and public policy and in our society or culture. And my side of the shop specifically deals with that last part is how are we kind of shifting the narratives and um, mobilizing public will around shifting those narratives that have um, led to this continued systemic oppression um, for women and girls throughout the country. So that's what we do over at the Law Center. Thank you for that. And Isra, would love to hear from you about the work of that NOPOF is doing. Great, and thank you so much for having me. Um, we're a smaller organization than the ones that my colleagues represent and very much appreciate being part of this conversation. So NAPOS vision is a future where AAPI, women and girls, our families and our communities have the resources and freedoms to thrive. So given this, um, we advocate obviously at the national and local levels. Um, some, some specific things I wanna mention are um, recently partnered with the White House on a briefing for our members about the infrastructure bill and the benefits, not just for the AAPI community, community, but specifically for AAPI women and working mothers. Um, we also supported recent legislation that denounces hate and xenophobia, as many of our members have dealt with during COVID-19. And then lastly, uh, we, we pulled together 30 civil rights groups in filing the only amicus brief in the Dobbs case that focuses solely on the experiences of AAPI women and girls. So what the future looks like for us is um, publishing data to uplift the lived experiences of our communities, including two reports next year, focusing on their earnings and wage gaps of AAPI women and on women and their experiences with medication abortion. Great, thank you for that. And Liza, would love for you to share, you know, a little bit more about your work uh, with Fair Fight Action. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johanna, for having me. I'm Liza Conrad. I'm the Director of Voter Protection at Fair Fight Action. We are a Georgia-based national voting rights organization, and we were to mitigate the harmful impact of voter suppression through litigation, legislation, and advocacy. And as you said, our country faces multiple crises that affect women from the ongoing pandemic to rapidly changing climate to the greatest threat to reproductive freedom since Roe. And we see voting rights really as the fight of this moment through which and only through which progress on all of these issues can be achieved. And whether or not women and our allies can make our voices heard at the ballot box determines whether we have legislators who will fight to protect our lives, to expand Medicaid, to support childcare, and establish economic justice. And you know, you said Texas was really the perfect example where we have been working with allies all summer um, to slow down anti-voter, anti-democratic legislation that ended up passing. And these same anti-voter legislators who gerrymandered themselves into their majority by limiting the participation of voters of color, disabled voters, young voters are now not only passing laws to restrict abortion, but also criminalize those people who are helping those seeking abortion care. And so we really see our fight as mitigating, connecting these dots and mitigating anti-voter bills at the state level, passing federal voting legislation at the national level, 
and educating and empowering voters to be a part of this conversation. And we need this all as part of a broad, broader strategy to enable us to participate in democracy and therefore protect and achieve our policy goals. As you said, this is really a decisive moment for our nation and the time has never been more urgent to take action to protect voting rights so that we can protect all of our rights. Absolutely. Well, I know I join our audience in thanking all of you for the work that you're doing. Uh, Melanie, in recent months, we've seen attacks on reproductive health, including restrictive abortion bans like the six-week ban in Texas, which led to this past weekend's March and Rally for Abortion Justice, which you know many of you here um, sponsored, as well as Emily's List, uh, the events and the rallies. What um, we see now is other states creating copycat bills for further to further deny people's access to safe abortions. Can you talk, Melanie, about the work that's being done to combat these restrictions? Sure. First, I want to talk a little bit about the impact we're seeing on the ground in Texas. So this this law has been in, in place for a little over a month, a month and four days, and we are already seeing people drive from Texas to Oklahoma, New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada, seeking the care that they need that shouldn't depend on where they live. Um, and you know, there was a patient who drove who suffered a sexual assault in Oklahoma in Texas and drove to Oklahoma instead of dealing with the trauma of the assault itself, had to figure out how to take off of work, how to get child care, and how to get herself to Oklahoma to get the care that she so desperately needed. This is the the real life impact of this egregious restrictive abortion ban in Texas. And as you know, we're already beginning to see copycat bills in other states. And so two weeks ago, the House took a, a really crucial step in uh, to protect access to safe legal abortion in passing the Women's Health Protection Act, also known as WIPA. And this establishes, formally establishes, uh, the right to access abortion and to provide abortion. Uh, a federal right to access and provide abortion. Some other things that we know are critical because you know a right without access is, is not a right at all as our reproductive justice partners say all the time. And so other things that are crucial is permanently eliminating the Hyde Amendment. Um, that means passing a federal budget, which we see is, is difficult in itself, but passing a federal budget without the Hyde Amendment passing the EACH Act, expanding Medicaid, funding Title X. We saw just yesterday the Biden administration thankfully reversed the gag rule, the harmful gag rule that limited access to reproductive health services. Um, and so we now have more access to Title X funding to provide that critical reproductive health care and more. There are, there's lots that the federal government can do here to step in. Um, and you know we are preparing whatever outcome should the Supreme Court decide to overturn Roe. But as we've seen in Texas, that is already beginning. Uh, you know, elimination of access to abortion is already happening in Texas. It could happen in other states, and Congress can step in and do something here. But in the meantime, we are fighting in the courts. Uh, we we have a case before the state court. We've gone to the Supreme Court. Uh, and we will continue to fight. We've signed on amicus briefs to the Department of Justice's lawsuit against the state of Texas. We are continuing to fight every single day against this law and we'll fight against every single other state law, but Congress can and should step in here. And we want the Senate to pass the Women's Health Protection Act. Yes, absolutely. No, thank you for that. Now let's talk about how abortion restrictions and lack of access to birth control impact people of color and the people who live in low income communities. Um, the reproductive justice movement, you know, looks at the intersection of race and class and other issues and how that impacts access to abortion. What are the economic implications to weakening access and why is it important to address reproductive justice? Isra, I'd love your thoughts on this, then would love to hear from you as well, Melanie. Yes, that's such an important question. So access to abortion greatly impacts Asian American Pacific Islander women. So we know that APIs are overrepresented in low paying service industry jobs and are more likely to not have health care coverage, let alone a doctor that they can trust. So for many AAPI women, having an unstable job without regular access to health care means being forced to choose between taking care of themselves or putting food on the table. 
So as a trained social worker, I believe that reproductive justice is an intersectional approach to supporting AAPI women and their families. So we can't just address health and rights. We must pay attention to the other factors that affect um, API women's reproductive health, such as lower wages, job security, immigrant status, and access to health care. Um, now, conducted a recent survey that revealed that 93% of us believe that women should have the right to make their own reproductive choices, which is why NAPOF works through the reproductive justice framework. So in spite of the shame and stigma that exists in our community around abortion care, AAPI women overwhelmingly support it and support um, reproductive justice. Melanie? And, you know, Ezra really covered covered it and our reproductive justice partners have been leading in this fight to make clear that uh everything that israel said i don't want to repeat her but um the the when you look at the attacks on rights right now if there were a venn diagram between mm -hmm. attacks on uh access to abortion access to voting rights lgbtq uh, attacks and white supremacists that venn diagram would be a circle it would be one circle Right. We know that at the core of these attacks is white supremacy and there are and have always been systemic and economic implications to white supremacy that we see showing up uh, when our rights are under attack. And so everything that Ezra said applies to black, Latinx, indigenous people uh, in this country, and we are fighting to center the impact of those communities every single day. So. Yeah, absolutely. Centering is is exactly right. Um, and Uma, we have seen how the pandemic has forced many women to leave the workforce because of job cuts, um, but mostly because of the lack of childcare services that are available. Can you talk about how economic policies need to center women and families? That's right. And I should also add that childcare apropos of this conversation is a critical part of reproductive justice work as well. So I'm glad you're asking about that. And um, also as a parent myself, this is, uh, a, this is a, what a ride I think that families have been on certainly through the pandemic, but really I think it's a mistake for us to think that this has really been an issue only during the pandemic, right? Um, and the impact on women has been remarkable. I, I'm wanting to make sure I get this right because it is really uh, upsetting, but the most recent Bureau of Labor Statistics monthly jobs report that I'm sure most folks are familiar with shows that the economy gained 235,000 jobs in August of 2021, but women accounted for only 11.9% of those gains. So if we put it another way, women in the United States would need nearly nine straight years of job gains at this level to recover the nearly 3 million jobs that we've lost during the pandemic. That is, you know, that is untenable. It's, it's not possible within, given the state of, um, affairs that we're in today. So centering women and families and the policy work that's being done right now is really the rising tide that lifts all boats. And culturally, I should also add, we need to shift the conversation away from childcare being this debilitating individual responsibility and instead understand that it's a public good. It's as a functioning, thriving industry, it affects everyone regardless of their care status. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to center these policies that actually don't ignore, as they historically have, the needs of women, especially Black and Latina women. And um, when it comes to child care, our hope right now is what we're pushing for is we need to make sure that families can afford child care. So even if women make these gains back in the workforce, child care is so exorbitantly expensive, they can't even afford it. And so they're having to make these difficult choices of having one parent stay home. So, you know, one of the economic policies we're pushing right now is that we're putting a cap on 7% of um, families' income that that is the cap that they would spend on child care. Families actually need to find child care. There are child care deserts throughout the country mm -hmm. that are, when you when you look at it as a perspective of and a part of reproductive justice work and you layer in all of the, the care deserts, um, the health care deserts and abortion deserts that exist in the country, that is also untenable. So we need to make sure that there's um, an abundance of, ch of child care that's available. And child care workers need to earn a living wage the workers are leaving the industry left and right because they can't take care of their own families. They're being tasked, it's skilled labor, they're being tasked with caring with the families of this country and they can't go home and provide for their own families and put food on the table for their families. So there's a 450 billion package 
that's um, on the table right now that will do all of these things. Um, we'll guarantee higher wages to caregivers and we'll also provide free pre-K to all three and four year olds. And so those are the things that we have our eyes on right now in terms of wanting to further the ball. And remember that if I can say so my, myself, which is maybe a little not popular way of saying things, but it's, it's, it's lazy and it's rude to try to get us back to March of 2020. These are policies that will actually further uh, the vision that of a better future for all of us that we're all working toward and to try and get us back to March of 2020 is really the wrong the wrong thing here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, it underscores the importance of having to elect, you know, more democratic pro-choice women who really understand are at the center of how these policies impact us. And so you know, this is, you know, this is what we do. This is what we do with all of you to get more of these women, um, you know, to run and certainly win. Now, this is a question for all of you. There's no doubt that there is still a lot of work to be done, especially in these very tough times. What keeps you inspired and motivated to do the work? Isra, I would love to start with you. Uh, thanks for bringing it to me first. So I, I will say, um, Aside from, you know, our API women elders and aunties that paved the way for me, I really do this work for my colleagues. So NAPOF has the most incredible staff um, and they work so hard and so deeply and respectfully with our communities. I'm, and I'm like continuously inspired day in and day out by them. And I also do it for our members because they live at the intersection of many injustices that we've talked about today um, and are often, you know, in the hard to reach community. So we're going to keep trying and we're going to keep fighting for them in, in what keeps it, it's what keeps me going. Um, and I, and the last thing that I tell myself, too, is that we are the only organization dedicated to API women and girls. So I always ask myself, if not us, then who? Mm -hmm. um, Eliza, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks. For me, it's the voters. Fair Fight Action was founded and centered on the idea of uplifting the experiences of those who are impacted by voter suppression and bringing them into the conversation. And so this summer we had the privilege of bringing 30 voters from all across the country to Washington DC to meet with senators and their staffs to understand why we need to pass the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity to hear directly from these folks who waited in line, who were improperly purged from the rolls, who have been intimidated as election officials, it's really for them and for their dreams. They wanted to vote for a reason for their families and their communities. And it's a privilege to have the opportunity to fight on their behalf. Thank you for that. Melanie, how about you? Um, my son, um, who is the legacy of my ancestors, um, my ancestors who have fought these fights before, you know, fought these fights before. I know sometimes, particularly for, for Black people in this country, it, feel, it can feel like we are going backward. Mm -hmm. um, my aunt, my father's sister, my aunt, was an abortion provider pre-Roe, mm -hmm. uh, who was arrested, charged, not convicted, but arrested and charged with abortion in 1962. We should not be going back in that direction. And so I am here fighting on behalf of my ancestors for the legacy that my son will carry forward. Amazing, thank you. And Uma would love to hear from you. What keeps you motivated and inspired to do this work? I mean, it's 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 fantastic because it's sort of shared with all of these fantastic folks on the screen as well. Um, I actually, we've been, um, there's a documentary about the activist Polly Murray, the civil rights activist. And so the Law Center has been doing some work with that film. And there's a quote um, that we've been sort of, it has been sticking with me. And so I thought I'd share that, which is, in not a single one of these little campaigns was I victorious. In other words, in each case, I personally failed, but I've lived to see the thesis upon which I was operating vindicated. And what I very often say is that I've lived to see my lost causes found. So the thing that keeps me motivated is, is the long arc. And that hopefully at some point down the road, we will all see our lost causes found. Mm. I love that. Thank you so much for all of you for sharing that. And I know for a lot of folks that are listening, including myself, you're all an inspiration as well to keep us motivated to continue to do this work. So thank you, Melanie, Isra, Uma, and Liza for sharing your valuable insight and for all the work that you do. And thank you for holding the line in the fight for all our rights. We're always grateful for your partnership. So thank you for being here. I know that, you know, one of the things I missed about all of this is the clapping. I'm sure there's a lot of clapping for for all the work that you're doing. So thank you. 
And now I'd like to turn it back to Keontae Lee, who will lead us into our next uh, session. Uh, Keontae. Thank you so much, Johanna, and to all of the panelists. Um, that was a great conversation. Um, and as I reflect on the leaders of that panel, this is just the perfect uh, transition to our next segment. Um, I would like to introduce the wellness break um, that will be led by Jamila Reddy, who is a transformational coach and a lifestyle designer. Welcome, Jamila. I'm really excited to have you and to participate in this session. And I guess we'll give it a few minutes as Jamila is transitioning. And while she's on her way, um, I want to talk a little more about her segment. She will definitely talk more about um, what she will do in the practice as she goes on. But we decided to introduce the wellness segment this year for the Netroots Women's Precon because we know that the work that we do is very hard, it's strenuous, and we've had some challenging, tough times over the past two years. And I believe in order for us to continue to do the work, to advocate for our communities, to support pro-choice democratic women and leaders, um, we have to take time for self. We have to take time to be still. We have to take time to be calm and to sometimes explore hobbies outside of our work. So once we're done and once we're rested and we're ready to go, we can go back and we can continue um, to advocate and to fight because we're at a pivotal moment in time where our rights are being attacked, where our rights are being threatened and we need to go ahead and rest so we can, you know, get ready to prepare for the next step. And I uh, am ready to welcome Jamila because she is the expert. Um, Jamila, welcome so much. You know, I am a fan and I am very excited to have you today. Thank you so much. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Hi, everybody. Um, today, we're gonna be doing a brief meditation practice. And I want to begin by reminding you or setting the stage and saying there's no wrong way to meditate. So if you had the thought of, oh, meditation, I can't turn off my thoughts, or I don't know if I'm doing it right. For now, just know that there's no right or wrong way, that whatever you do is perfectly fine, and that the point here is practice. So we will begin. So wherever you are, if you're able, I invite you to close your eyes. Closing the eyes helps you focus on your inner world. And if your eyes are open, you can just focus on one thing on the screen, a plant, whatever spot on the wall, but just let your attention be focused and start to connect to your breath. Just start to breathe and feel the feeling of breath in your body. Giving yourself permission to arrive. Giving yourself permission to be fully present for the next 10 minutes. Giving yourself permission to access this moment of inner peace, of inner quiet, and inner calm. We'll begin today's practice with a grounding exercise. So as you continue to breathe deeply and slowly, I want you to visualize that there is a cord or a root extending from the base of your body all the way to the center of the earth. And this grounding cord is anchoring you to the seat below, making sure that you are held and supported making sure that you are centered and fully here in this moment. So if you can adjust your posture ever so slightly to make sure that your spine is aligned, you want your spine to be long. I like to imagine that my spine is dignified, whatever that looks like for you. Have your spine in a dignified position and breathe. 
I'm going to lead you through a practice where you're going to count. We're going to, I will model it for you, where you're going to inhale for four counts. You're going to hold your breath for four counts. You're going to exhale for four counts, and then you're going to pause for four counts. So don't worry. I will guide you through the whole way. We'll begin now. <clears throat> Breathing in for one, two, three, four. Pausing for one, two, three, four. Exhaling for one, two, three, four. And pausing for one, two, three, four. Big breath for one, two, three, four, hold for one, two, three, four, exhale for one, two, three, four, pause for one, two, three, four, inhaling for one, two, three, four, pause for one, two, three, four, big exhale for one, two, three, four, and pausing for one, two, three, four. And you can let your breath return to its natural state now and just take note of what has shifted in your body. Take note of any sensations that you feel, any warmth, tingling, tension, whatever you feel without judgment, just notice the sensations in your body. I'm gonna invite you to keep breathing deeply into your belly, imagining that your belly is like a balloon that is being gently filled and deflated with every beautiful breath. And taking a moment to just acknowledge anything you're carrying with you in this moment, any sensations in your physical body, any thoughts in your mind, any emotions in your heart, whatever you're carrying with you, just a moment to acknowledge what it is without any judgment or assessment there's no need in this moment to analyze or assess or problem solve just be with your breath and take note of what you're carrying i'll give you a moment to breathe at your own pace full inhales and exhales, just taking inventory of your inner world. If you notice that your mind is active or busy, that your thoughts are coming quickly, I invite you to imagine that your breath is a golden ball of light. And I want you to tap into that inner scientist, that curious child that lives within you. And I want you to just study the way that beautiful golden ball travels up and down your body as you breathe. So just be curious, be open, focus on your breath. Watch your breath as it travels up through your rib cage, up into the throat, out the nose. Just study your breath. And I invite you now to call to mind one desire that you have, whether that's a desire for yourself, a personal goal, whether that's an intention that you have to be of service to community. 
whatever your desire is, whatever your heart and mind came up with first, one thing that you want, again, not judging, not analyzing, just letting that desire be present for a moment. And I want you to tap in to how it would feel in your body for that desire to be fulfilled in this moment. That it's no longer a desire, but a present reality that you live in now. Take note of how that feels. And breathe as you notice. Perhaps it brings a smile to your face, allow it. Perhaps it brings a sense of accomplishment or gratitude. Whatever it brings up for you, just let that feeling be in your body for a moment. Connect with that energetic and emotional signature, the way that it feels in your body. Now I'm gonna invite you to take one grounding breath in through the nose and out through the mouth. And call to mind one small step you can do to move you towards this desire being a reality. One small step. And just let that inner wisdom be loud in this moment, trust that voice of intuition. And perhaps here you wanna bring one or two hands to your heart and just make a commitment to that action, make a commitment to that vision, make a vow, a promise, an agreement with yourself to honor that vision to honor the many small actions it will take for that vision to become reality. And with your hands on your heart, take a moment to send yourself gratitude, to celebrate yourself for your vision, for your generous heart, for the boundless love that exists within you. Send yourself gratitude, say thank you Thank you for showing up in the ways that you do, for your willingness to be a participant in creating goodness and affecting change in yourself and in the lives of others. Before we close, we'll take three grounding breaths, breathing deeply in through the nose and out through the nose. Breathing in, breathing out. Not rushing yourself. Sometimes we can feel like we need to rush and get the breaths in and out. Really take your time. Breathing in deeply, exhaling completely. One last final breath, breathing in and breathing out. Thank you so much, everyone. You can gently open your eyes, come back into the virtual room, take note of what has shifted in your body. Notice the ways maybe you feel a little more open or grounded. And remember that this is always available to you that even when you cannot control the world around you, you always have agency, sovereignty, and choice about what is going on in your inner world. And the more you practice being grounded, being calm, and being clear, the more powerfully you're able to show up for the people you serve. So keep that in mind. Remember that it's never selfish. It's never frivolous. It's never secondary. It's foundational to take a moment to be with yourself, to connect to yourself, connect with your breath, 
and everything you do, everything you create and everything you offer comes from that place. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I think we might have some time to chat for a bit. If there's any questions or um, anything that anyone would love to share. Thank you all for practicing. I appreciate your willingness. Wow, um, that was amazing. Um, Jamila, thank you so much for offering those moments of stillness um, as I reflect on the work of the panelists and the leaders in this, um, in this program. It's, it's hard work and it's very important that we all prioritize wellness in order for us to be our best selves when we're advocating for our communities. So first I wanna say thank you. And I love that you mentioned during the practice, um, just acknowledging that it's not selfish to prioritize your, your well-being. It's actually necessary. And that makes me think about a quote, a quote that I've seen floating around over the past couple of months, just rest like radical self-care. And I would love for you to talk more about that and maybe share a little more about your journey and how you started um, just in the wellness industry. Absolutely, thank you for this invitation to share my story. And I, I love this because it actually, uh, my journey to my own wellness and self-care practice actually started um, in the midst of political and social upheaval <laughs> where there were cries to, you know, that black lives matter. And I remember hearing that and thinking, do I believe that about my life? That there's this external plea, this external reminder that black lives are valuable. Am I treating myself as if my life is inherently worthy? And myself that question, because you can try to convince people, right? But if you don't believe it, you're not going to be very convincing. So I had to, I, I heard myself saying that and I had to check in and say, am I treating myself as if my life is inherently valuable? And the answer in that moment was actually no. Hmm. That I wasn't actually considering myself as part of the community that I was serving, that I was advocating for. So I thought I can actually, and then I'm, I'm the only, I'm the only life that I actually have full control over. It's just this mm -hmm. one. It's just this one. Of course I can affect change in the others, but this one that belongs to me, I have full agency and control over. And so I wanted to have integrity and to act and treat myself as if I was, if, as if my life was immeasurably valuable as if I were powerful and necessary. And so treating myself in that way, I realized that that's actually an offering in and of itself to show up every day with the belief that my life matters and that I'm worthy of care, of love, of softness, of ease, of beauty, of rest, of pleasure. When I move with that knowing, I don't have to try to convince or teach that that is that alone is service. That alone is an offering, is being that mirror, being that evidence of possibility, that reminder. And so that's how I came to it, was wanting to really walk the talk, so to speak. Um, and also realizing that the more I pour in myself, the more equipped I am to show up in service, the more energy I have, the more ideas that I have. There's this beautiful Trisha Hershey of the, the NAP ministry. If you're not familiar with Trisha Hershey's work. I'm right there with you. Amazing. She tells this beautiful narrative about how Harriet Tubman had the idea to lead the enslaved people to freedom in a dream that it was during sleep where she came up with this idea. So just the idea that rest and ease is where we create these radical visions, that's what I wanna leave with people. That's where it starts. Wow, wow. Jamila, 
thank you again for not only leading the session, but just providing background. I love what you said. Um, we have to acknowledge um, if we actually care about ourselves in order to go forward and go out into the world to care for others. And it starts with us because we have to prioritize ourselves. So I just want to thank you so much. And we may need to have a one-on-one -on -one later offline. Yes. <laughs> so I have your contact information and I may be reaching out. <laughs> yes, please do. And everyone feel free to reach out. I love to hear from folks. Thank you, Jamila. Um, so now we're going to move on to the next uh, portion of the program. For our next panel, I would like to welcome Sarah Kermy, Vice President of State and Local Campaigns. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much, Keontae, and thank you everyone for joining us today. This past year, it has never been more apparent what is at stake in states across our nation. Access to the ballot box, labor rights, reproductive justice, and the health and safety of our communities hang in the balance and our state legislators are at the front lines of it all. We are very fortunate today to be joined by four of our incredible Democratic women state legislators to talk about their leadership on these critical issues and the importance of having women at the table at the state level. With that, I would love to introduce our panelists and welcome them. So first we have Nevada State Assemblywoman Chandra Summers Armstrong. We've got Texas State Representative Mary Gonzalez, Michigan State Senator Stephanie Chang, and then I know we will we will have one more panelist joining us very very soon, um, and that will be Arizona State Senator Victoria Steele. So thank you so much for joining us, legislators. Welcome. We really appreciate you joining us for this very, very timely conversation. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in because I know folks are really eager to hear from you all and hear about your work. So to get started, I would love to hear more about your motivation to run for office in the first place. Um, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong, can you share your story to start us off? Good afternoon, Sarah and panelists and viewers. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Chandra Summers Armstrong and I'm the Assemblywoman for Assembly District 6 in Las Vegas. Um, I didn't intend uh, at this stage in my life to uh, be in the Assembly. I started this work years ago, um, mostly doing community stuff, right? Um, uh, uh, things that have to do with land use and then uh, uh, working to get a road opened uh, in our community that was closed in a historically uh, underserved community. And one thing led to another. I ran for city council and successfully a couple times. Uh, and then this opportunity happened and it took about a couple of weeks for me to think about it. Um, but at the end of the day, um, when you know that you have the, the heart of your community uh, first and that they need leadership um, and someone asks you, um, we are often compelled to raise our hands. And that's exactly what I did. Absolutely. That is amazing. Uh, we hear that so often where women um, end up stepping up to run through action in their community and um, leadership. So thank you so much for sharing that experience. Senator Steele, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome. We'd love, to, I don't know if you got had a chance to hear the, hear the question, but we were um, asking folks about their motivation to run for office in the first place and would love to hear your experience as well. Ah, uh, well, thank you for having me here today. Um, I had always had this sense of, I knew that I could make a difference and I sort of knew that I was supposed to be on that path. Um, but I was afraid, particularly of the asking people for money part. Um, that was really tough. So I, I put it off, put it off, put it off. And then my congresswoman, Gabrielle Giffords, was shot. And a lot of other people were shot and were killed. And I learned about that news when I was about a mile down the street and I saw all of these emergency vehicles and helicopters in the air and I turned on the radio just in time to hear that my congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords had just been shot and 
I just was struck by how short our time is. And I'm thinking if I've got this, this sense of, I know I can make a difference, then what am I doing wasting my time? Am I taking up space on the planet? So I, I made a vow right then and there within seconds that if I was ever presented with an opportunity to step forward and lead, that I would not shrink away from it, that I would stand up and do it. And two years from that date, I was elected to the State House of Representatives in Arizona in the seat that Gabrielle Giffords used to hold. I'm now in the Senate and my first week in the Senate, I discovered that I had Gabby's old desk. So it, it to me, it was really, really important to be able to stand up and do things like that. And this gives me a chance to do that. Thank you for that. That's such a powerful story. Thank you for sharing that. Senator Chang, we'd love to hear about your experience as well. Thanks, Sarah. And I, I love hearing other people share their journeys. Um, that's so powerful to know that you're literally sitting in her seat. That's that's pretty amazing. Um, so I, um, before I ran for office, I was a community organizer, you know, worked for various nonprofits doing organizing and advocacy work around social justice and civil rights issues, everything from affirmative action to indigenous, indigenous defense reform, um, you know, co-founded a group doing Asian American civic engagement work. Um, and so was really engaged in comprehensive immigration reform and voting rights and things like that. And, um, you know, I had uh, been someone who mostly was trying to encourage other people to run for office. Um, but, you know, when the opportunity came up, um, my then state representative Rashida Tlaib, um, you know, as she was entering her last term in the state house, uh, really encouraged me to consider running for her seat. Um, and I, I thought she was joking the first like two or three th times that she talked to me about it. Uh, but eventually, you know, we I started talking to people about it. Um, and over the course of six months, just realized, you know what, this is an amazing opportunity to try to make an impact on issues I've already been working on. And, and so many of the things that I care about uh, for my community. And, you know, so that was in 2014. Um, now I'm in the Senate and uh, it's been quite the journey. Um, we've got so much to do, but it's been a tremendous honor and um, eager to keep going. Absolutely. We're so glad you made the leap. Uh, Representative Gonzalez, how about you? Thank you, Sarah. And I'm so excited to be here with all these amazing women. Like, how exciting is this? So I always say that my journey in politics started as a political telenovela. Um, it's really, from all the things you would see in the telenovela is my political journey. Uh, but I was a professor at a university here in Texas, and I never, I worked as a staffer, but I had such an awful experience, honestly, with sexism in the Capitol that I vowed never to come back to the Capitol. And then um, Annie's List, an organization, very similar to Emily's list, asked me to run for office. And because I had such a bad experience, I was like, I know never again. But my students were the ones who convinced me to run for office. But I will say, I only thought I was doing it um, to show my students how to participate in democracy. In fact, I told my university, hold my classes, I'll be back next fall, because I never really thought, like, hold my beer, hold on, hold my classes. Um, I never really thought I would have been able to overcome a lot of the barriers from my district and in the state. In, back, in, back in the day when I ran, which was in 2012, um, there wasn't an LGBTQ woman. There, was, there wasn't a woman who'd ever run my seat. There was all four guys running for office. And I was this young graduate student who no one had ever heard of and um, running for office. And we broke all those glass ceilings. And really, when people ask me how we did it, it's because there was a collective of women who came together to help me overcome every single barrier that existed before me. So really excited now, been a state legislator for a decade and um, feel like we're doing good work advocating for people who, who sometimes don't get their voices shared. Absolutely. Well, that actually is a really excellent um, segue into the next question um, we'd like to talk about, which is why you all feel it's so important for us to elect Democratic pro-choice women 
to state legislatures and how you you feel like your presence at the table changing policy conversations at the, at the state and local level and how it's making that difference to, to have you all there. Um, Senator Chang would love to start with you and your experience with that. Yeah, I mean, I think it's so important to have um, pro-choice Democratic women um, engage and and in office um, so that we're at the table when decisions are being made and so that we can lead um, on issues affecting women and families. Um, I became a mom in my first year in office. Um, and then, so I have, so yeah, 2015 took office, pregnant, had a baby. And, you know, as a mommy legislator, I think that has really shaped so much of how I view issues, how I take a look at, you know, what is this bill going to mean for my kids um, and their generation um, and constantly trying to think about things from the perspective of, um, you know, how does this issue affect the most vulnerable? How does this issue affect families? How does this affect women? Um, and that's why it's so important to have uh, women and women of color, um, you know, part of um, the decision making, um, not just for the sake of numbers, but truly because we we are needed to shape the best possible policy. And you look at some of the crises that our state um, in Michigan and in our country are facing. You, know, you talk about child care, um, the huge exodus of so many women from the workforce. I mean, we've that's these are major crises that we need to solve. And um, women are the ones who really um, need to be shaping and leading these conversations um, so that we can solve these problems um, and impact not just the lives of women and families, but really every single American. And so um, I believe that women are uh, collaborative leaders um, typically and um, women, we get things done and we um, are very much, you know, I think a lot of us are really focused on, you know, how do we, how do we really lift up the voices of people who tend to be forgotten? And so um, we absolutely need more women. Um, it's been really, really inspiring to watch more and more women run for office and win uh, who are unafraid uh, to take on big issues and just be bold and, um, and really stand up for what their communities need. So hoping more, there will be many, many more to come. Absolutely. We're right there with you. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong, what are your thoughts? Um, I think that this is, um, this is how we get a groundswell right? Um, we, we want women at the table. We need women at the table. And we need diversity of thought and diversity of background and diversity of position at the table so that when we are making legislation, um, it's, it's well thought out. Um, you know, I'm an older woman who uh, ran uh, for office. Uh, I'm uh, from a, a very conservative background. Um, I'm conservative religiously but also recognizing that uh, my voice, my, my experience in life has informed how I move forward. And it's important that um, I listen, that I work collaboratively, that I am representing people who are just like me, black women, um, uh, women who have had children, uh, women who have lived uh, in poverty, women, uh, who don't necessarily have um, uh, a formal education, right? Our voices are still important and, and our needs are still critical. And if our voices are not at the table when decisions are being made, they're just not there. And if there was one thing that I learned um, in the 81st session of the Nevada legislature is that um, there were instances that if I didn't bring up a topic, it never would have been considered. And so that's why it's critical that diverse voices are at the table because we inform um, policies from perspectives that those who have um, privilege or have had access historically don't necessarily consider. And so if we're not there, we're not heard. So we need to be there all the time. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Representative Gonzalez, what do you think? 
Yeah, I think that the diverse representation allows for the issues be to become more humanized, right? So they're not just seen as statistics or these far off examples, but really human and it allows for it to be connected to people's experiences. And the humanization allows for the um, building of authentic relationships. The authentic relationships can move people. So I'll give an example. When I first got into the legislature, um, I was the first open, open LGBTQ woman in Texas. Now there's there's a whole team of six of us. And what has happened is you have seen a shift in some understanding from some of our more conservative members in regard to public policy when it comes to LGBTQ issues. Um, in fact, one of my colleagues who will remain nameless, a reporter asked him, like, you came in as like the most anti-LGBTQ legislator, according to Equality Texas, and now you don't file any anti-LGBTQ legislation. And he asked him why. And he said, well, Mary Gonzalez is my best friend. And, He's my, I might be his best friend, he's not my best friend, but the point of the matter is, is humanizing relationships and those authentic relationships can at least stop some bad public policy. And that's why we, we need to be at the table. Absolutely. Those relationships are really critical. Thank you for that. Senator Steele, how about you? You're on mute. Sorry. I'm going to evoke the memory of Shirley Chisholm. Um, if we are not at the table, we are on the menu. And if you get a seat at the table and you get there and there's no chair for you, bring your own. So just, it is so vital that we're there. Um, Representative Gonzalez just said a minute ago that there are so many issues that if she had not brought them up, they wouldn't have been they wouldn't have been considered. And I see that every day. I see that every year. Um, I have been able to get legislation on um, regarding domestic violence, regarding sex trafficking, regarding the Equal Rights Amendment, regarding um, sexual assault and, and protection orders and child um, child abuse and, and clergy and that sort of thing. And it, if it wasn't for me being there, somebody who has experienced these things, I, those probably would not have ever, if they would have been brought up, even by any number of the wonderful, intelligent, wise, young white men who preceded me, even if they had brought it up, I don't know that they would have done a whole lot more other than push the button and vote the right way. But because this is personal, I was able to advocate. I was able to fight. I was able to, to articulate what was important and why and get that change done. And so that's, that's what I'm working on. That's, that's why it's so important that we're there. Absolutely. That's a really excellent and important point. So switching gears a little bit, um, we know that across the country, reproductive rights are at stake. Um, what efforts are taking place on the ground to support those who need this important care in your community? Um, Representative Gonzalez, I'd love to start with you and have you talk about um, the experience in Texas. Oh, gosh. So many things happening in Texas right now. I can't even, it's even, it's hard to know where to begin. But obviously, um, Texas is in the spotlight nationally because of our awful anti abortion. Um, piece of legislation. And for me, what is more critical is the, is the intersections of identity. So when you see how women of color have the highest rates of maternal mortality, and then you, put, you, and you dovetail that with awful legislation when it comes to anti-abortion legislation, you're really putting at risk the lives of specifically women of color all over our state, rural women, low-income women. And I think what what I think is really critical for people to think about is not only are these pieces of legislation harmful, they're even more harmful when you start looking at the, at the margins of folks and folks um, who have different experiences. And so um, for me, I'll give an example. I live on the border. Um, I'm very proud to be from El Paso, we, but what ends up happening when we create these um, anti 
healthcare piece of legislation, where and people end up going across the border. Well, I love Juarez, and that's where my family's from, but there also is a very real reality of, um, of danger going across the border right now in Juarez. And so we're asking women to risk their lives in so many ways just to have access to healthcare. That is beyond me. And so that's why our voices and being at the forefront is really critical right now. Absolutely. That. Thank you for sharing that. Um, that's heartbreaking. Senator Steele, how about you? Well, there is an all-out assault on abortion access in, in our state houses across the country. We all know that. These extreme, dangerous bans on abortion are blatantly unconstitutional. And their ultimate goal, it's very clear. It is to overturn Roe v. Wade and completely outlaw abortion. Now, we already know that Republicans like Arizona State Senator Wendy Rogers are very eager and they are ready to pass a similar bill like Texas SB 8 this session. Our caucus is ready. We are ready to fight against this bill. The political outreach on, on all of this is an attempt to control women's personal decisions. And we need leaders who understand that it's not their place to play judge, to play jury, and to play doctor with women's lives. Absolutely. Senator Chang, how about in Michigan? Yeah, well, I mean, I, uh, I was just at the Women's Health in Detroit on Saturday super inspiring to see, you know, um, to see so many women and kids and, you know, um, and our allies that um, are, are really standing up and fighting back. And, you know, like the Senator, it's a little bit hard to hear you. Sorry, sorry it's, a, it's a little bit hard to hear you um, it's right now. Oh, really? But, yeah. Uh, can you hear me a little bit? It's a little bit better. Yeah. Sorry to okay. interrupt. I'm not sure what happened. Sorry. Um, but so what's going on in Michigan is that we have a 90 year old law um, that uh, criminalizes abortion. Uh, so this is from 1931. Um, and if Roe v. Wade were to be overturned, um, that law would basically come back into effect. And so that would have huge implications for, I think there was a recent study that showed 2 million uh, Michigan women that you know potentially could lose this access to care. And so um, in Michigan, we have um, a number of bills um, spearheaded by my colleague Erica Bass um, and, and others. I'm so proud to be part of it to really just to repeal that ancient law um, so that we can uh, really just make sure that we have access to care for everyone. And I, I think that, um, you know, we, we also are hoping to, in November, uh, reintroduce some legislation regarding, um, you know, basically the Reproductive Health Care Act that would restore a lot of what we need and, and really put in place a lot of um, forward-looking measures to make sure that uh, abortion access is affordable and safe and, uh, and that the decisions are made between, you know, a person who can get pregnant and their, and their doctor and no one else. So, um, excited to to move that forward and i think that you know in michigan it is a definitely an uphill battle um on these issues but we're going to just keep fighting um and i think that we are seeing so much momentum now with uh with women and so many others that are just continuing to to fight back and so um you know we've just got to keep this fight going we've got to keep really lifting up people's stories of people who have the only way that they would have had the children that they have is because of the abortion they had, or the only reason they were able to live was because of the abortion they had. Those are stories that we need to continue to lift up um, and honor those that have made that tough choice um, and continue to really remind people that abortion is health care. Um, so we're going to keep fighting in Michigan. Uh, we stand in solidarity with all of our colleagues, whether it's Texas or Arizona or anywhere else where these rights are under attack. Uh, you know, this is really something that we've got to 
keep keep fighting for. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong, how about in Nevada? Well, we we have a um, every two year legislative session and ours just ended. And so we didn't have any uh, legislative attacks um, on, re on women's reproductive rights. What we did have were bills that uh, uh, were brought forward to help strengthen um, health care for women. Um, but I, I said earlier, no, I'm a, I'm a religious conservative and I'm and I'm an older woman. I've got three kids and um, I. I, I can remember what happened when we had a march on Saturday for reproductive rights. And I can remember listening to Senator Pat Spearman and, and I, I'm not gonna get the words exactly right, but, but this is kind of what she said. You know, you, they don't want abortion. They don't want any exceptions for rape and incest. Then you don't wanna have any significant and meaningful healthcare funding for children once they're born. Right. And we have all these issues with uh, women's maternal issues. Um, you know, the numbers are horrific for black women, uh, uh, three to five times more likely to die in, in childbirth uh, because of, of poor access to health care. And we passed a bill this uh, session uh, that allowed doulas to be uh, financed, paid by Medicare. Um, and then we even have another bill that is going to actually do some studies for numbers in Nevada on uh, maternal outcomes. At some point we have to ask ourselves, is this really about abortion or is this something else? And, and from where I'm sitting, it, it appears to be something else. Um, if you care about babies and children and life, life doesn't end when the baby's born. Life is when <laughs> life is life. And are we really caring about children here? And what are we doing to show our communities that we really, really care about how they move, uh, how they raise their children and whether they have access to dentists and healthcare? Are we really serious about it? Or is this just a control mechanism? And I think we all know what the answer to that is. Um, and so um, again, this is important. This is why we need diversity at the table because we talk about these things candidly am among ourselves, no matter where we're from as women, we have these conversations because we know how this affects our lives every day. I've been a single parent. I know what that feels like to be concerned about healthcare costs, to be concerned about food, to be concerned about the lights and air conditioning. These are real life issues that women are not afraid to discuss at the table and we're not afraid to solve these problems. And this is why we must be present at the table because we're gonna look at this, these problems holistically, not just unilaterally. We know that it all fits together. And that's why I'm really proud to serve and proud to serve with amazing women. It's, it's amazing. Absolutely. I think some of the proactive um, legislation you mentioned really exemplifies how amazing it is to have a majority woman legislature, which unfortunately not everyone else on this panel um, gets to gets to work in. <laughs> so I think uh, they might be a little bit envious of you, but we appreciate all the good work you're doing with that opportunity that you have. So um, we, we just talked about choice. Um, another issue that is impacting women and their families this upcoming uh, election is voting rights. Um, what specific measures have you undertaken to be sure that people can access the ballot box? Um, Senator Chang, can you um, talk about what the Michigan State Legislature is doing on the issue of voting rights, which may not always be about making sure people can have access to it, unfortunately, I know. <laughs> yeah, um, well, hopefully my audio is better now. Um, but okay, great, good. So, you know, so there's the there's the voter suppression bills that have been moving um, in the Michigan Senate. Um, but we also have you know, bills where we can actually, you know, talk, do proactive good things. Um, so we'd love to talk about that. But I'll talk first about the the, the, there's a, a 39 bill package um, that the Senate Republicans introduced um, uh, earlier this year. Um, seems like a long time ago now, but 
um, that would do so many things, um, including, you know, make it harder to um, have drop boxes and uh, require photo ID for things that really, we've already got a photo ID law. Why don't we don't need to add any more requirements? Um, and it, just the list goes on. It makes the bills that they introduced um, and some of them, you know, made its way to the governor's desk and got vetoed um, are bills that are all designed to um, really try to promote this lie that somehow our election was stolen, um, which it was not. And so um, I, uh, you know, we are, we have been standing really firm in, in trying to reject these bills. Um, thankfully, we've got an amazing governor, Gretchen Whitmer, who um, is unafraid to, to veto these bills um, and, and really deliver a strong message to say these bills are based on a lie. Um, they would make it harder to vote and are based on a lie. And so uh, we've got to keep saying that. We've got to keep reminding people that uh, we've got amazing clerks who do uh, a really good job and they need uh, to be supported in the work that they do, not um, you know, find ways to build up more challenges for them and for voters. Um, our democracy is very much based on um, everyone being able to have that access to the ballot box um, who's eligible to and and we should be doing more to actually increase access. So um, I've actually been working on and we haven't introduced it yet, but we're I, I've been working on a bill related to language access um, because we know that there are a lot of voters who um, who reading English or speaking English is just not not uh, what they're able to do. And so we need to actually increase access. Um, you know, think we, we do have the Voting Rights Act Section 203, which requires some some people um, to to have um, you know translated ballots and bilingual materials. But we uh, really need to expand that. And so uh, I've been working with a number of folks on in Michigan about um, actually proactively building in uh, some of some of the national uh, policy. And so, you know, we haven't introduced that yet, but um, that's just one example. There's so many things that we need to do. Um, in addition to that, I mean, we have to, we need to allow our clerks to be able to pre-process absentee ballots. Um, right now, uh, the system is just so, <laughs> it's, we basically set them up for long nights and sometimes multiple days of, of counting, um, you know, absentee ballots when we we need to um, make it easier. Um, thankfully, in 2018, Michigan voters uh, proved by a very large margin uh, a number of, of um, you know, policies that make it easier for people to vote, um, including no reason absentee, which we did not have prior to that. Um, and so now that we've got these tools, we've got to protect them. And we've got to make sure that we provide the resources and the re, uh, and the tools that are needed to our clerks to be able to do the job that they set out to do. Um, so, you know, we're we are ever vigilant on protecting voting rights in Michigan. Um, and I'm looking forward to also, you know, uh, hopefully one day soon introducing some of this proactive legislation, because in addition to protecting our voting rights, we do absolutely need to. Um, find ways to continue to expand access as well. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Senator Steele, how about in Arizona? Well, um, everybody knows that Arizona is has been home to this three ring circus called the Fraudit, or otherwise known as the audit sham, the audit scam. Uh, this is going to be a very serious issue coming um, in this coming session in Arizona, voting rights, probably the most important issue. We have seen Republicans and they are hell bent on going after the security of our elections and our right to vote. The sham audit they conducted recently in Arizona just simply served to help them excuse the yet to come attacks on our voting rights and they are about to launch new attacks. We're ready for them. We fought hard in our caucus and with outside voting rights groups to um, stop them last session, but sadly we are in the minority in Arizona. Our caucus has a number 
our pro-voting bills and we sponsor them every year, every session, but sadly, they never see the light of day. So all we can do at this point is to try and stop the bad voting rights bills. This is a long running challenge. The battle is going to continue. I think what we have to do in Arizona is to make sure that we elect um, Katie Hobbs, who is right now our Secretary of State. She is running for governor and we need to make that change so that we can stop these bills um, from being signed into law in case we're not able to uh, flip the House and the Senate in Arizona. Yes, thank you for that. We've all been watching that unfold. Um, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong would love to hear more about what's happening in Nevada. Well, I we're not quite having these challenges that some of the other folks are having. Um, I, I am so grateful um, that we uh, passed legislation um, uh, um, in, uh, let's see, it's AB 321 um, that establishes procedures for the use of mail-in ballots in every election. Um, and that was um, <laughs> a monumental uh, legislation brought by the Speaker um, of the House, Jason Frierson, and our Majority Leader, um, uh, oh my God, Teresa Benitez Thomas, um, and and that was passed through. And several years ago, we passed. Um, and I think it's called uh, Question Five, which allows people to be able to register to vote when they register their cars. Um, so, you know, right now Nevada is in really good good shape. Um, we are concerned about what we are seeing. Um, to our east in Arizona and what we're hearing further east in Georgia and Texas and other places, right? And I think that, um, you know, I think a lot of this could be solved and helped if we had a national voting rights bill, right? And, and I think that, um, you know, this is where um, we need to have movement on a national solution. Right, we have been here before. Black people have seen this before, right? We fought hard for this uh, in the civil rights era for voting access. And uh, now we are seeing a resurgence of the same type of uh, behavior, you know, dress in a different, you know, color dress, but it's the same foolishness, um, which is to disenfranchise people, uh, to shut down people's voices, uh, to make it more difficult. Um, to find excuses um, where people can't vote. You know, you might as well have a poll tax. You might as well ask someone how many jelly beans are in a jar. You know, this is what we are looking at. And it is scary and it's sickening to believe that here we are again. And so I think we just have to double down as a nation, um, support one another across our state borders um, in, in, in the fight and, and just recognize that we absolutely cannot go back. We can't, we have to do everything we can to support one another because look how hard it was for us to get voting rights. And then if you backtrack, it'll become even more difficult. Um, so we really have to stand firm and support one another's efforts. Absolutely. Representative Gonzalez, do you wanna talk to us about what's happening in Texas on this issue? Well, I think the whole world knows what's happening in Texas regarding voting rights. It's really disappointing. But I will say um, one of the things I've been fighting for is, again, like, not to sound like a broken record, but the intersections of identity. Right. And so particularly, you know, we created this this dozens of pages of bills to talk about a problem that doesn't really exist. But the consequence of that is the most vulnerable people were impacted. So people with disabilities particularly were impacted through the Texas elections bill. So if you have, if you are a person who needs an attendant, the, the extra rules that were put, that were put on attendance were, were, in a, were so harmful, are so harmful that it'll have a negative impact on people with disabilities voting. And so I have been fighting tooth and nail to make sure that we have um, representation when it comes to, to, that, to that community. And so I know we're running out of time, but I just really wanted to say, I'm, it's been so inspiring to hear from all these women and all the work they're doing across the country. And thank you to Emily's List for all that you do. 
Thank you. Thank you all. This has been such an amazing discussion, and I know we could continue it all day and into the night, but uh, unfortunately, as you mentioned, um, we're, we're running out of time. Um, thank you so much for making the time out of your, all of your busy schedules um, to have this inspiring conversation, and of course, for your ongoing leadership in your states. We so appreciate that. Um, so, um, again, thank you so much. Um, of course, a discussion of the critical work that is happening in our states would not be complete without mentioning the elections that are right around the corner, um, especially in the state of Virginia. So with that, I am so excited to introduce our next speaker, candidate for Virginia Lieutenant Governor, Delegate Hala Ayala. Welcome, Hala. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having me today. I'm Delegate Hala Ayala, proudly running to make history as Virginia's first woman of color and woman Lieutenant Governor. You know, uh, my path to elected office was not a traditional one. I just have to say that if you told me two decades ago when I was working at a gas station, pregnant with my child, my first child, that I would be here today as a candidate for statewide office, I'd have definitely told you, you were nuts. I'm an Afro-Latina, single mother of two black children and a daughter of an immigrant. I am the exception, not the rule. There were very few leaders who looked like me or had my lived experiences, and that has to change. My political engagement began in 08 when Senator and presidential candidate Barack Obama came to Prince William County and hearing him speak changed my life and inspired me to get engaged. So after a decade of activism and knocking doors and also organizing Virginia to be part of the first woman's march in Washington, and after Trump's election, I picked up my clipboard, grabbed my sneakers and ran for office for the first time. And we made history then in 2017, there was a blue wave election and I became the first Afro-Latina cybersecurity expert to ever serve. While serving in the House, we move Virginia forward light years. We expanded Medicaid to more than 500,000 Virginians. We ratified the Equal Rights Amendment and expanded access to reproductive health care. This is what happens when we elect leaders, especially women leaders, with a firsthand understanding of what their communities need. The power, this is that power of representation. So for everyone watching today knows that our governments work best when they look more like they pe the people they represent. And women are 51% of the population. And it's time for our state legislatures, Congress, Fortune 500 boardrooms, tenured college faculty, and so much more to reflect this. I always say you can't be what you can't see. When Obama said, yes, we can, I believed him. I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't heard those words. We need to teach more young girls that, yes, Yes, they can. And I don't have to tell you, as we're looking across this nation, Republicans are launching unprecedented attacks on our reproductive health care. It's gonna come down to our state legislatures to protect the right to choose. And in Virginia, our state Senate is a 2020 tie on the issue of abortion. The next Lieutenant Governor will be that deciding vote. If, vote if a bill like this comes to our General Assembly. My opponent has made it crystal clear that she won't hesitate to bring Texas vigilante abortion policies here to the Commonwealth. She and her radical Republicans across the nation, I have to say this to you, not my Commonwealth and not my country. We need elected officials who are gonna think big and hear every Virginian's voice in Richmond. And make no mistake, our health care, reproductive health care, our democracy, funding for our schools are all on the ballot. In-person and early voting has already been in full swing here in Virginia. So we've got to turn it up, turn it out, and sign, seal, and deliver those ballots. Our lives depend on it. And Virginia, as we know it, depends on it. And we've come too far to let Republicans take us backwards. So I know you are tired and you've been fighting for a long time but I need you in this fight with me. I need you to help us to deliver Virginia one more time. We need to dig deeper, elevate and reach higher. And I'll say it again, we need to dig deeper, elevate and reach higher. 
We know where we've come from. We know where we need to go. Join me at hollerforvirginia.com. Let's get to work and let's make history. Thank you, Virginia. Thank you, Netroots. Thank you, Delegate Hala Ayala, for those incredible remarks. Emily's List is extremely proud and excited for your journey to making history as Virginia's first Afro-Latina Lieutenant Governor. If you want to help elect Hala Ayala and many other of the and many of the other Democratic pro-choice women in Virginia, please consider volunteering for Emily's List Help From Home GOTV program, where you will get to speak with Virginia voters directly from the comfort of your home. Please sign up at the link that will be in the chat. Furthermore, I want to thank State Representative Mary Gonzalez, Assemblywoman Chandra Armstrong, Summer Armstrong, State Senator Victoria Steele, and State Senator Stephanie Chang for fighting for the rights of your constituents. Thank you, Jamila Reddy, for offering a moment of stillness and calm when this work has us in constant motion. To Melody Newman, Isra Pananon Weeks, Uma Iyer, and Liza Conrad, thank you for what you're doing at the national level. You are bringing your lived experiences to your work that affects so many of us in a positive way. To Amy Allison, thank you for speaking on behalf of Netroots and for, for allowing us to host this incredible event for your audience. Emily Kane, thank you for kicking off this event and sharing the history of Emily's List. Thank you to DJ Jazz for setting the vibes because good music makes everything better. And last but not least, thanks to you, our audience. Thank you for your energy, your drive, and your commitment to being change makers. Stay in touch with us by texting JOIN to 47717. We'll also add that information in the chat. We're now at the network part of our program. If you would like to stick around from 6 to 6.30, where you will have the opportunity to connect with other attendees and learn more about supporting Democratic pro-choice women. So this is important. We have three different rooms that you can join, and I'm going to tell you about those rooms. So the first room is resource sharing. This will be the opportunity where you can share any resources connected to the topics discussed today, and you can also share that information in the room. The second room is our wellness networking room. We'll continue the conversation about self-care and mindfulness in our fields, building off of our wellness break. And then lastly, it's our women in campaigns networking room. We know some of you are joining us from campaigns or interested in working on campaigns. This is a space to learn about opportunities with Emily's List and to share other campaign opportunities with groups of women and campaigners and volunteers. Thank you so much. And you all now have the opportunity to choose those three networking rooms. We appreciate your time and have a good evening.